Celeste Mano was born on November 22, 1996, in Melbourne, Australia, to parents Tony Mano and Aggie DiMauro. She also had an older brother named Alessandro. Growing up, Celeste loved to dance and was a popular and well-loved girl. She was particularly close to her mother, Aggie, so much so, that even at the age of 23, Aggie would still tuck her daughter into bed every night. In June 2019, Celeste was working in a call center and had worked her way up to being the team leader. One day at work, she had to escort another employee who she had only known briefly, out of the building after he was fired. Celeste hadn't known the worker but had felt sorry for him. Before they parted, Celeste apologized to the man and extended her hand in order to shake his. But before she could do anything, the man grabbed Celeste and kissed her on the cheek. This would be Celeste's first direct encounter with 35-year-old, Luai Nader Seiko. The encounter had left Celeste feeling embarrassed, and that evening, she had told her mother all about it when she arrived home. Her mother didn't think anything of it and told Celeste that the man had probably had a crush on her. Realizing that her mother way right and that it was nothing more than a harmless crush, Celeste put the awkward incident behind her. After all, she had recently started dating Chris Risdale, a man who also worked at the same call center as Celeste. Just days after Luai was fired however, he contacted Celeste on Instagram. I can't stop thinking about you, he wrote. I can't get your eyes and gorgeous smile out of my head. Alarmed, Celeste once again confided in her mother. From this point on, Luai's fixation with Celeste quickly grew as he bombarded her with more and more intimate messages. I've never felt this way about anyone in my entire life. I'm totally infatuated with you, captivated and fascinated by you. I'd give my life in the world to you, just to be with you. Celeste messaged back politely informing Luai that she did not reciprocate these feelings and asked him to leave her alone as she felt uncomfortable with his unwanted advances. But it seems that her rejection only fueled him more. She had wrote, Stop contacting me as this is making me very uncomfortable. Please respect my wishes and stop. Despite Celeste's pleas to Luai, his messages were constant. As time passed, they began to get more nasty. In one message he wrote, I love you with all my heart, so forgive me when I say this but you're lame. Celeste blocked Luai's accounts but no sooner had she done so, he would create more profiles to harass her on. The stalking was becoming relentless. Celeste decided to no longer plead with Luai and instead began to ignore his messages. This would make things even worse as Luai's desperation grew. In one lengthy message to Celeste, he had become angry claiming that she turned out to be no different to the majority of women, and that he would devote every ounce of energy to proving to the world that he was somebody. He vowed to no longer contact her. Unfortunately, he would not keep this promise. Celeste's boyfriend Chris has since spoken about the pain of watching the effect that the harassment had on Celeste. She was frightened and could not eat or sleep due to the relentless stalking. Her mother Aggie expressed concerns to her daughter that he might find out where she lived. But Celeste quickly shut down her mother's concerns and stated that he would soon get bored and stop when he accepted that she was not interested. But sadly, he would not and this was only a brief glimpse into the horror of what was to come. After six months, Celeste and Aggie finally decided that enough was enough. They headed down to their local police station to file a report but the police told the women that Luai had not committed a crime. Therefore there was nothing that could be done. The officer they spoke to turned to Celeste and told her to just ignore him. After telling the police officer that this is what she had already done, the officer responded with, well that's just social media these days, if you don't like it, get off social media. After being turned away, Celeste felt even more helpless and vulnerable. The police were unwilling to assist and hadn't so much as taken Luai's name. For the next six months, things would get even worse. Luai Seiko was soon sighted outside of Celeste's workplace. He had now started following her and had even figured out where she lived after having followed her home one night after work. The Instagram messages he was now sending had become sexually explicit. Have you ever had a beast pounce on you Celeste? He wrote. I want some fun. Celeste. If you had my body for a day what would you do with me? A single girl like yourself is bound to be switching from one C asterisk 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 to another. Probably because deep down you know you're kinky. Hence this makes you a slut. It seems that Luai Seiko was now visualizing what he wanted to do with Celeste in the most vulgar ways. 
Celeste and her loved ones were now extremely worried about Luai and his intentions with her. Celeste and Aggie once again went back to the police. This time, they had more success. The police officer that they spoke to this time, was more than willing to listen. He took a full statement from Celeste and took down Luai Sako's details. He advised Celeste to get an intervention order immediately. Luai was soon served with a personal safety intervention order, which meant that he would be prohibited from contacting Celeste and if he went against this order, he would be arrested. Aggie however was not convinced that her daughter was safe and warned her daughter. This is just a piece of paper sweetie, let's remember that. For a month, it seemed that the intervention order had worked. That was until a three-page letter popped up on Celeste's Instagram account. It was Luai Seiko back again. This time, he was pleading with Celeste to stop ruining his life. Please see reason Celeste. Please Celeste, the ball is in your court. There's a desperation in my voice because I'm afraid. I'm afraid that my life is fast derailing and steering off track. Everything that I've worked for, improved on, suddenly seems to be fading away. But there's still time to undo this Celeste. Please undo this, were just some of the words in the letter. Proceeding on in the letter to blame Celeste for the trouble he was in and taking no accountability for his own actions, he pleaded with Celeste, writing as if it was her fault that his life was on a downward spiral. Only you can end this Celeste. Please end this nonsense by withdrawing the order and stopping the charges against me for stalking and harassment. And if you make the right choice Celeste, both of us can move on and we can finally have peace of mind. After having breached the order, Celeste alerted the police. They reacted and arrested Luai. It was a moment of relief for both Aggie and Celeste. The mother and daughter thought that the nightmare ordeal was finally over. Unfortunately, they were wrong and Luai's next move was to purchase a weapon. Meanwhile, Celeste finally began to enjoy her life. Carefree and not having to look over her shoulder for the first time in a year. She even enjoyed a date in the beautiful town of Fitzroy, Melbourne at a rooftop bar with her boyfriend Christopher. One of his favorite memories of the pair, unknown to the loving young couple at the time, was this this was one of the last places the pair would get to visit together. Their final photo together would show them both beaming at the camera on a glowing sunny day. Celeste could not wait to post the image to her social media. It would be this photo however, that would trigger Luai Seiko to commit his most horrific act yet. One that would take the life of Celeste Mano and rip her away from her family, forever. After having been released from police custody, Luai had once again taken to stalking Celeste. He was monitoring her posts on social media to work out where she was, what she was up to and who she was with. He also staked out her home and discovered which room in the house was hers by watching the windows and activity within them. It was November 16, 2020 when Celeste and Aggie were the only ones home. It was bedtime and they had just said goodnight to each other. The memory Aggie ever had of her daughter was as she stood at Celeste's bedroom door and asked her if she wanted her bedroom light on or off. Celeste had told her mother to leave it on, stating that she would turn it off herself when she was ready. Okay. Love you, Aggie told Celeste. Love you more, Celeste had replied as her mother closed her bedroom door. Just before 4 a.m., armed with a hammer and a large kitchen knife, Luai Seiko smashed through Celeste's bedroom window and violently attacked her. Hearing a shattering of glass and a loud commotion, Aggie raced from her bed, screaming Celeste's name as she rushed to her daughter's bedroom. As she entered her daughter's room, she stood barefoot in glass. Noticing blood all over her daughter's room, she ran to Celeste screaming and asking what happened. As Aggie tried to pull her daughter out of her bed, she noticed that Celeste was lifeless and not moving. Outside, security footage showed Luai Seiko fleeing in his car. Aggie desperately fought to save her daughter's life as she pleaded to her daughter to not leave her but sadly, it was too late. Celeste Mano was dead. Emergency services arrived quickly to the home and police informed Aggie that it was now a crime scene. A knife had been found in the bedroom where Celeste had been killed. After hearing this, Aggie became frantic and screamed, Oh my god, he killed her. Officers were alarmed to hear Aggie claim to know who killed her daughter and took Luai Sako's name. An autopsy report later carried out showed that Celeste Mano had been stabbed a total of 23 times in a frenzied attack. It had been a strike directly to her heart that had killed her. As she lay asleep in her bed, Celeste had not stood a chance against Luai Seiko. 
However, his evil act was not over yet. His next move proved how premeditated the murder had been. He drove directly to the police station to hand himself in. He began asking officers to shoot him and blamed law enforcement for her murder. It was clear that Luai was trying to get away with imprisonment on mental impairment. Aggie quickly began to learn the law so that she could be prepared of what was to come. The more she learned about the justice system however, the angrier she became. The case was in and out of court for the next three painstaking years until Luai Seiko finally pleaded guilty to murdering Celeste, but only after failing to convince psychiatrists that he was mentally ill. In court, Luai Seiko was forced to look at a glowing orb made from his victim's ashes as he sat through his sentencing. All the while, Aggie shouted to him, She's dead, she's dead. Go have a look, he said. You know what happened, it's your fault. Luai, who was now 39 years old tried averting his gaze from the glowing blue statue placed next to the Aggie as she spoke about her daughter to the court. The outcome of the sentencing would be just more heartache for Celeste's family. Aggie was particularly devastated to hear that her daughter's killer would be imprisoned for at least 30 years. Luai Seiko had showed no emotion throughout the sentencing and expressed no remorse. She later spoke outside the Victorian Supreme Court surrounded by Celeste's father and brother, to express that they had been let down by Victoria's authorities. We were forced to trust the system that we lost faith in three years ago, she said. It failed Celeste then, and it failed her again now. Outside of court, Aggie said law reform on stalking promised to her after Celeste's death had still yet to be implemented. I've had three and a half years of endless meeting. When these people met with me they made promises, commitments. They wanted to start with the Victorian Law Reform Commission's report into stalking laws, she said. The VLRC report was tabled well over a year ago. I waited and waited until I could wait no longer, I basically realized the door was shut. There were lots of promises made, none of them honored.